Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open to the book of Psalms. We'll begin in Psalm chapter number 85. We want to look tonight at uh, how mercy fits into justice. Mercy is not the opposite of justice. Uh, it is not uh, to relinquish or relieve justice. They do work hand in hand. And because of that, the Lord, uh, the Lord is merciful. There's no doubt about it. David uh, had to uh, ask for God's mercy on more than one occasion. And it's kind of interesting because David is known as a man after God's own heart. And David understood uh, how God operated. He understood the character of God. He understood uh, the, the principles that he gave to him. David was not always the, the perfect one to follow what God had instructed, but he understood that sometimes when he did wrong, God would have to punish him. We could uh, turn to one of the most uh, memorable times in David's life, and uh, the very last chapter in uh, 2 Samuel, where David was instructed at one point not to number the people. God did that because he said, don't worry about how many you have. You just worry about who it is that's going to fight for you. David, uh, and, uh, but at one point, David's heart uh, began to tug on him a little bit, whether he was just cold-hearted towards the Lord at the time or whatever the case may be or, or what. I have no idea necessarily. And uh, maybe it was just that uh, uh, we would call it the Napoleon attitude. He was in government, and uh, David was king of that day. Uh, but he was still uh, subjected to temptation and things of that nature. And so uh, he said, I want you to number the people. Now, he had already told Joab, uh, God's already instructed us not to number the people, so don't worry about it. He will, he will give us the victory when he leads us. And so uh, even at that time, when David turned around at a different time now and said, uh, I want to number the people, even Joab came to him and said, don't do this. Don't do this. And David angrily told him, you'll do what I tell you to do. And Joab said, yes, sir. And uh, he went about and uh, he took basically the, the census of that day to find out how many uh, soldiers and warriors and fighting men he had and things of that nature. And the Bible tells us that a second that he brought back the report that David's heart smote him. And in that instance, he knew that he had done wrong. And God said, uh, okay, David, and actually gave David an opportunity he said, I'm going to punish you because you've disobeyed. See, even though God is, uh, God is just, the greatest thing about God is not only his love, and he is love, but the greatest thing about God is he is just. He is. If that was the case, and uh, when man sinned in the garden, uh, God would say, well, I'll just, I'll ignore that one. I'll ignore that. But God does not ignore sin. He just cannot and will not. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ had to come and die on the cross to pay for sin. Because you and I could not pay for it. And in that instance, there had to be payment made. And so, uh, and so the Lord Jesus uh, was uh, the one that had to make payment because God's justice demanded it. Now, getting back to David for just a minute as he faced the, the judgment of God. God gave him three options. He said, uh, you can choose this one, this one, or this one. And David said, well, I'll, I'll choose. And he chose the one that he would basically fall into the mercy of God. because, And that was literally how he phrased it. He said, I, I would rather fall into the hands of God than fall into the hands of men. And in that particular instance, uh, God did bring judgment. And finally, as a perfect example of this, God's justice was then being metered out. And finally, the death angel was heading toward Jerusalem, and uh, David was just brokenhearted, and God said, that's enough. See, God's mercy is always, and we'll look at that a little bit, in the midst of difficulty and in the midst of punishment, and at the, at the, in the midst of the justice that's being metered out. Because you and I have to have that justice to keep ourselves right. But even in the middle of it, God shows up and says, okay, that's enough. And, uh, and we'll look at that just a little bit. And I want you to notice here as David is jotting some things down. In, uh, in Psalm chapter number 85, look if you would please in verse number 10. Beginning in verse number 10, the Bible says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness 
shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. Notice in verse number 10, mercy and truth are met together. Truth is that uh, element of what is going to be, if you would, the rule that justice would have to be metered out. And so let me give you some statements if I could, and then we'll look at it. Well, you're not far from there. Turn just a page or so over to Psalm chapter number 89. Psalm chapter number 89. And notice how that uh, David phrases this in verse number 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. So God is making it very clear that justice is who he is. That is his character. That is his nature. That is his makeup, if you would. And all that revolves and is connected with truth and thereby love. And so because of that, uh, David understood very clearly that God is going to be just. He is going to be right. And so in the process of being right, there is oftentimes the element where because we are sinful, we're going to mess that up. And that's where God's mercy, it, do, you have, do you understand that in the Garden of Eden, there was no need for mercy. It wasn't needed. Grace was not needed. None of those things were needed because sin was not prevalent. The thing that brought those elements that sometimes we crave, we don't crave the justice of God. God, would you please punish me? We don't usually do that. That's usually not. It's usually, I hope he doesn't see. I hope he doesn't notice. I hope he's forgiving. I hope he's merciful. And he is. But all of those came, things came into play because he knew very clearly that you and I were going to be a needy, peop, needy people. And because of that need, uh, because sin created it, now he was going to be able to meter them out. And uh, in that instance, everyone is always somewhat fearful of the justice of God. Oh, God's punishing me because of this. Oh, God, because uh, he's punishing me because he knew how I am. And it, God's not interested in punishment. He really is not. He just knows that it's necessary. And in the midst of that punishment, you'll find out that his mercy is ever new and is very, uh, very able to take care of the need. Let me make some statements if I could. Number one, mercy does not operate in the place of justice. Mercy does not operate in the place of justice. In other words, God is not going to set aside justice in order to implement mercy. Because mercy, number two, mercy always operates within the boundaries of justice. And so God is not going to excuse justice uh, or uh, excuse it by any stretch of the imagination. That's why he made it very clear. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saves us. That's why no one is going to get to heaven someday and say, oh, I made it on my own merit because it's not by any works of righteousness that we could do, but it's only through him. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man could boast. But they cannot because it's only through the, the mercy of God that uh, we were able to receive salvation. Justice demanded that there's a payment that be made. And the Lord Jesus Christ stepped up to the plate to pay that payment so you and I could be back in fellowship and be back to God and make our way back. And uh, in that instance, they do not oppose each other. And by the way, so understand that. Justice and mercy do not oppose each other. They work within the boundaries of each other. And uh, mercy operates within the boundaries of justice. Number three, mercy is not overlooking or withholding punishment. Mercy is not overlooking or withholding punishment. Uh, you know, it, it does us well to look at this. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn to 2 Samuel, chapter number 28. 2 Samuel, chapter number 28. 2 Samuel, chapter number 28. I have a, okay, chapter 24. I knew it was the last chapter. I was <laughs> thinking here. one in first Samuel. I don't know what I was thinking. I want you to notice in the very first phrase of uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 24, and again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. 
So because of an injustice that has been done, and it goes on to say, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. And so uh, as we go down through that, verse number three, and Joab said unto the king, now the Lord thy God, add unto the people, how many soever they be, and hundredfold that the eyes of my Lord the king may see it. But why doth my Lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding, the king's word prevail against Joab and against the captains of the host. And Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. Verse number five. And they passed over Jordan and pitched into uh, Aror on the uh, right side of the city that lieth in the midst of the river of Gad and towards uh, Jezer. And they came to Gilead and to the land of uh, Tatimha Hashi. And uh, they came to Dan Jaron and to Zidon and came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of Hivites and of the Canaanites. And they went out to the south of Judah, even to Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king. And there was in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. And the very next words in verse number 10, And David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. See, David realized he had sinned. You say, well, the second that I realized it, shouldn't everything come to a halt? No, there's still some justifying of the balance. There's still the, the punishment that has to be metered out. You know, just as uh, God understands very clearly that when we do wrong and when we sin, when we do the things that we should not, there has got to be a recognition of the punishment and even an administration of the punishment to administer to us. In other words, we can't think, well, we can get away with it. Because when we think we can get away with it, guess what we're going to try to do? Get away with it. And so does every child that's ever been born on God's green earth. If they think they can get away with it, they give it a shot. And in that instance, uh, Okay, let me put it like this. You knew the teachers you could get away with stuff with. You knew them. Because you already knew that, well, that, you know, they won't care or, or, they'll, or they won't do anything or whatever the case may be. See, it's a little bit of a tragic thing that's going on in a little bit of the country today. Uh, folks are, are doing things that they should not lawlessly, thinking they're not going to do anything to us. And so in that instance, and when uh, government begins to pull back on that so that justice cannot be metered out, then all of a sudden there is an imbalance. And we recognize it. We recognize the imbalance that's going on. And uh, because of that, God says here, there's been an imbalance because injustice has taken place. And now it's got to be metered out. So God now did not refuse to bring punishment on David. Did he love him? Yes. Uh, but in that instance, uh, David even realized, I've sinned. You say, well, the second that you run to the altar, shouldn't God just stop the punishment? Sometimes the punishment doesn't stop immediately. Sometimes uh, that, that law of sowing and reaping is still in place. And sometimes there is still some things. To, but in the midst of that, that's where mercy steps in. So I want you to notice, because God now came and because David did realize his sin, because God did realize that David had recognized what he had done. Well, now all of a sudden, that's where mercy begins to slide in. So God said, okay, David, uh, I'll give you a choice then. And that's exactly the mercy of God. Justice, yes, but mercy now in the midst of the, judge, in the, midst of the justice. So notice what it says in verse number three. So Gad came to David and uh, told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee, and that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now in the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hands of men, because men are not just, but God is. 
So the Lord sent a pestilence unto, uh, upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. It's kind of interesting because you find out how many fighting men they had. And then you see uh, how many men ended up dying now. Verse number 16 says, And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil. This is where mercy steps in. And said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough. See, that's what God's mercy does. Does he stop the judgment from coming? Sometimes not because it keeps us on track. But in the midst of the judgment, God says, okay, that's enough. And God shows us very clearly the very perfect illustration of how God does that. The very same thing in the Garden of Eden. He could have allowed death to take Adam and Eve immediately. And he could have created more. But he said, no, I'm going to allow now them to understand what redemption is. And let them understand what a savior is. And let them understand how much they need a daysman, the Lord Jesus Christ, to go with them. And so, as I said, mercy does not operate in the place of justice. Mercy always operates within the boundaries of justice. Mercy is not overlooking or withholding punishment because God is just. God's greatest character is his righteousness and justice. His love is always within the justice. Number four, justice always comes before mercy. Justice always comes before mercy. Just as we see here, but let me show you another example of that if I could, the way that, that the Lord states it. Take your Bible and turn to Micah chapter number six. Micah. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and then Micah. Micah chapter number 6. Because Micah gives us literally kind of the formula here that the Lord Jesus used. Micah chapter number 6, and look at verse number 8 if you would please. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. So he gives you the, the actual layout of the outline, if you want to put it like that. The very first thing he says that you're to do justly. In other words, you're supposed to be just in what you do. But you're supposed to love mercy. So that means in the midst of the justice, in the midst of metering out what needs to be done, that there is always mercy that's mingled in with that. Because uh, keep this in mind. Scripture reminds us that the letter of the law killeth. The Bible reminds us that uh, if we was to receive the justice that we so rightly deserve, we would have no help whatsoever. But in the midst of that, God said, that's where I'm going to place the mercy. And in the midst of that mercy is where God begins to show his great love. And so uh, he is not removing the just. He is not removing the justice. He is just. He is righteous. But he tells us that we're supposed to understand that also. And in order to understand that, he gives us the perfect example, walk humbly with thy God. And so he says that you're to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And Micah understood that very clearly because justice always comes before mercy. So in that, and this is how it works, so let me, uh, let me kind of phrase it. Mercy is a guard to prevent punishment when no law is present. Mercy is a guard to prevent punishment when no law is present. So in other words, it's a little unjust, even in our child-rearing days, where we only presume that the child should know the difference between right and wrong and what we expect of them. Now, they'll learn that later on, but if there is no, if you don't tell them, don't drink out of the milk jug. So when you catch them and you're going to throttle them, you're, how dare you? He, you know, he's just going to turn around and say, well, that's what daddy does. And, uh, but uh, in that instance, it's like, I pay for that meal, <laughs> but don't be drinking out of the jug, all right, don't do it. But uh, in that instance, uh, that's where you have to make sure that there is a law that is present. Now, if the law was not ever stated and it was never put down, then you would have an excuse to say, I didn't know. You, we all know the expression that if you're, if you're going too quickly, an officer friendly pulls you over, and, uh, and if he asks, and by the way, if you want a very, very, good answer when he asks you, do you know why I pulled you over? 
do not answer that. Never answer. Say, because my wife's showing out, that's why. Whatever you want to get. Don't say, yeah, I know I was speeding because now you've just admitted guilt. The second, the second you, I shouldn't be telling you this, the second that you admit guilt, then that means you could be guilty of other things also. So now you are a suspect and you no longer have, you've just, you've just given away your rights. Because when he says, I want to search your car, you say, oh, no, you're not. You've already admitted to guilt to doing something wrong. You may have done something else wrong. You're a suspect, and now anything else is suspect. You've just set them aside, and you've done it willfully. Don't do that. Some of us realize setting aside our rights is sometimes not a thing that we want to do easily. If they're going to be taken from me, you're going to take them from me. I'm not going to hand them over. I don't like it, and you shouldn't either. You've been, given, you've been given rights by God, by your country and things of that nature. Don't just hand them over. Make them, if they're going to be taken from you, make them do it uh, violently. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go that route or not, but uh, don't, don't just hand them over too easily uh, because after a while you'll turn around and say, what has happened? And uh, in the light of things that are going on even today, uh, I encourage you to... Uh, be stalwart in the things that you've been given. All right? In that instance, mercy is a guard to prevent punishment when no law is present. So make sure that the, the law is stated. Like I said, if Officer Friendly pulls you over and you say, I didn't know. Now he's going to say, ignorance of the law is no excuse because there is a law that says this. So in this instance, uh, oftentimes injustice shows up when there's not been a clear-cut expression of the law. And believe me, it ends up in courts all the time. So mercy is a, is a guard to prevent punishment when no law is present. Next, mercy does not immediately believe an accuser. Mercy does not immediately uh, believe an accuser. So just because someone's been accused of something, mercy says, I don't have to believe that just yet. I don't have to. That's where mercy should reside. Because justice may have to be metered out, but you don't have to believe the accusation that comes. Next, mercy does not want to punish. Mercy does not oftentimes want to punish. Next, mercy does not look for guilt. Mer mercy does not look for guilt. You, you know that person that's always looking for <laughs> to find something uh, wrong. Always look. You know, it, it's a sad thing when the boss's main job is just to find something wrong with what you do. And uh, because that, that uh, guess what? You're, there is always something that could be found. Always. But the individual that uh, realizes that if I let them grow into the position where they're at, if I help them to be more of what they should be, they'll do the other things. I mean, it's easy to come up and say, yeah, I appreciate all the work that you've done, and you've done it exactly as you're supposed to do it, and done it within a timely fashion, and matter of fact, a little quicker than that, but... Why didn't you sweep the floor? You get a person that you say, you know what? Thank you for doing that. Man, you are going to make us, you're going to make us money. You're going to make this thing something else. You're going to make, and right on down the road, guess what? He'll sweep it on his own. Now, I know that uh, you say, well, he might not. Uh, I guarantee he will start uh, putting some pride and effort into what's going on. And, uh, and that will be the end result of it. God does not always look for guilt. He does not. He does not always look because he wants to punish. He is not. Let me move on. Mercy watches to prevent excessive punishment. Can I show you what I'm talking about here? You're not terribly far. Turn back, if you would, please, to the book of Hosea. Just, just turn back a few pages in your Bible from Micah, and you'll find the book of Hosea, chapter number 4. And we'll begin there. Mercy watches to prevent excessive judge, uh, punishment. Because even as I said earlier, next, mercy is kind while justice is ministered. I want you to notice, if you would please, the Lord here in this particular instance in the book of Hosea. Look at verse number, chapter number 4 first. We're going we're gonna to jump through this kind of quickly here. The Bible says in, uh, in verse number 14, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredoms, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. Uh, for themselves are separated with, whor I mean, the Lord's talking angry here. And he is, uh, he's telling the people what's going to happen. But I want you to notice when you come down to verse number 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. 
let him alone. He says, I'm going to step away from Ephraim. He says, I'm going to just leave them to their own devices. I'm going to let the difficulties come their way. I'm going to let Ephraim, because of the things that they've done, he says, I'm just going to let judgment fall on them. And notice, if you would, even as he comes over to chapter number 7 and verse number 8, the Bible says, Ephraim hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. This is where we get the expression half-baked. Strangers have devoured her strength and have known it not. Uh, yea, gray hairs are here and, and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face. And they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all of this. And uh, he goes on and explains some things. I want you to notice when we come to chapter number 8, verse number 2. Israel shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have uh, set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols, and they, uh, and they may be cut off. And he just goes on and on and on. And uh, uh, as, even as we go down a little further, look at verse number 11. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be upon him to sin. I have written to him great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. They sacrificed flesh for the sacrifice of mine offerings, and eat it, but the Lord accepted them not. Now will he remember their iniquity, and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. For Israel hath forgotten his maker, and builded temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Sounds like justice is getting ready to be metered out. But as we come down just a little bit further, we see chapter number 11. I want you to notice when we come to verse number 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam. They burned into incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke of their jaws, and I laid meat upon them. He shall not return into the land of Egypt, but the Assyrians shall be his king, because they refused to return in the and the sword shall abide on his cities and shall consume his branches and devour them because of their own counsels. And my people are bent backsliding from me. Though they, called, uh, though they called them to the most high, none at all would exalt him. But I want you to notice this next phrase. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How? He says, as much as you need punishment, he says, I've just got to extend mercy. He says, because I, I do love now, it doesn't mean that he's, uh, <laughs> because in verse number 9, notice how he states it. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. He made it very clear. He said, I'm not going to give you the punishment that you deserve. He says, because my mercy is there. Because this is the way that it works. Mercy is kind while justice is ministered. Mercy is kind while justice is ministered. Mercy restores after the punishment. Mercy helps restore after the punishment. And then mercy ends the punishment when payment is complete. Mercy says, I'm not going to hold this over you for the rest of your life. And in that particular instance, uh, the Lord makes it very clear how mercy and justice operate together. Is justice necessary? Yes, it is. For civility, for, for peace, it's necessary. But mercy also fits into the midst of that because sometimes justice uh, metered out. Aren't you grateful we don't get everything that we deserve? Because the Lord made it very clear that he is just, but he is merciful. And that's why uh, scripture makes it very clear that his mercies are new every day. Great is his faithfulness. That's how mercy and justice work together. It's how the two uh, needs to be metered out. It's how you and I will oftentimes need to operate with uh, justice and mercy. We'll look at one more thing in the week to come and uh, on justice, and then we'll uh, begin another study in the weeks to come. All right, let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed tonight. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you again for the truth of your word, and Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help us now to follow according to his principles. Help us, Lord, to, uh, in the midst of the times that we need your help, 
we know that you're going to be merciful. Help us, Lord, to recognize when uh, justice is coming our way that you will extend mercy. Thank you for it. Thank you for both of them, Lord. And I do ask now that you'd please just help. Lord, help our country. Thank you again for our church, and we ask now, of course, for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.